Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So today is a very unique Sunday. It's a special Sunday. It's a Sunday that's going to have a little bit of a different feel, but will be a significant Sunday not only for some of our staff, but also for the life of our congregation, because today we are officially ordaining Chris Haugen as our executive pastor, um, no longer serving as our executive director. And so this is going to be probably a new experience, too, for many of you who have been at church, Meadowbrook Church, over the last handful of years, because in my time here, we've never done an ordination service. And so it probably raises all sorts of questions for us, like, like what, what is ordination? Like, wh- why are we doing this? How did we get to this point? And so um, just to kind of set the stage for what ordination is and how we got to this point and and why we're doing it and what we're going to do, Um, here's just a little context for ordination. Because if you've not grown up in church or been part of different church traditions, maybe you've never seen an ordination service or even know what do we mean by ordination. And so ordination is simply the process by which a church affirms an individual's calling. And so we would say, uh, Chris has been called to ministry. He came from the secular world. He felt a specific call from the Lord to pastor a church and be part of a church staff. And that calling is now being affirmed by our church saying, yes, we affirm that that is what God has been doing in your life and is doing in your life. And so essentially you could say when a church ordains somebody, what they're doing is they're affirming something that God has already done, or they're affirming something God has already already affirmed. And so it raises another question. If we're affirming something that has been done, what specifically are we affirming in an individual's life? And we say that ordination affirms five things. Those five things are one, a person's character. Two, it affirms their calling. Three, it affirms their gifting. Four, it affirms their training. And some of you may know that Chris recently completed his training in receiving his doctorate degree from Corbin University. Corbin, I have that right, right? Yeah, Corbin University in Oregon. So he is now Dr. Chris Hogan. After today, he will be Reverend Dr. Chris Hogan, right? (laughs) And then lastly, it affirms doctrine, specifically that there's alignment with what our church's statement of faith is in Chris and other staff members who are being ordained align with that. And so the process through which uh, somebody goes to be ordained is something back in 2020 we started as elders started putting together. 2021 we completed that. And there's basically four steps to the process of ordination. One, it's the, the individual affirming their desire to be ordained, Fe- feeling as though this is something that God is calling them to and they have a desire to it. And the way that they name that desire for the elders of our church is through a written narrative uh, that just simply lays out their calling. And then from there, there is an intentional period of mentoring where uh, Chris, over last summer and kind of leading up to that, met with Mike Rohde and Charlie Shirley, two of our elders, on a kind of bi-weekly basis just to get to know each other better, just to simply be in relationship and understand the story of Chris's calling um, and how he was led here. And then from there, uh, Chris had to write, in addition to working on his doctorate and writing his paper for that, he had to write a paper that defends the statement of faith of our church. Um, It's something that ends up being 35, 40 pages. In that paper, there are also pastoral issues, pastoral case studies. How would you respond to a person in this situation? How would you navigate this situation in a congregation? So he has to speak to those. And then lastly, he sits before our elders and deacons and kind of gives a, an oral defense of his paper. We ask him questions for like two hours and then ask him to clarify things in his paper and really seek to understand that, yes, there is alignment when it comes to doctrine, philosophy, and approach to ministry. And so Chris has done that process over the last year, and then it culminates with being affirmed in front of the congregation, like we're doing today, for people to see that this is the work that Chris has done to get to this point. And so our hope for today is to speak into the life of Chris and essentially to give him a charge to say, this is what you're being called to, and to put that charge in front of him, not just to speak to him, but hopefully for all of us to see that in some ways we all have a part to play in this, in that the call of a pastor, um, while it might be unique in serving the church in a vocational role, 
It also has a lot of the same functions when it comes to leading people, bearing witness, shepherding those around you that everybody in a congregation has. We're, we're all called to participate in ministry together. So our hope is, as we give a charge to Chris, you'll be able to hear things that you would say, yep, yeah, that applies to me as well. And so myself, along with two other individuals, um, are going to give that charge. We have Nathan Enns, who is the pastor of the church. Uh, it's Kingswood. Do I have that right? Kingswood Church in Oregon, the church where Chris came from before he served here. Uh, he and his wife, Kelsey, are here to participate in that. Uh, my dad, Mark Marvel, is here. And it's not just because we needed somebody else. And I was like, I'll call my dad. Um, Chris has been a part of a men's Bible study that my dad leads. And so he's been faithfully doing that for the last couple of years that he's been here. So my dad knows Chris well. And so Chris asked for these two individuals to participate today, to speak into his life, to speak into this moment uh, so that they could be voices giving him this charge. And then Chris also chose the passage that he wanted to be charged with, and it's Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. And so if you have a Bible, we invite you to look there. Uh, you can find it again in one of the in-house Bibles in the seat back in front of you. And so I'm going to spend just a few minutes saying a few things from this passage. I'm going to pass it off to my dad, Mark, and then he'll pass it off to Nathan, to each give a charge to Chris. And so this passage in Micah 6, 8 begins with questions coming from the mouth of the prophet, specifically Micah, but personifying Israel. He's asking questions as though it's Israel, the nation of Israel, who is asking these questions. And the questions revolve around how is one supposed to come before the Lord in worship? specifically when they're coming to bring offerings, because that was a normal part of worship in ancient Israel. And this is what we read in Micah 6, starting in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So we're jumping into the tail end of what Micah has been saying all throughout his book, and Micah has been giving a message of warning and judgment to Israel, specifically because Israel has wandered away as a nation. They have disobeyed, they have broken their covenantal agreement with God, and they have done things on their own terms rather than settling into obedience and following, following God's ways of doing things. And so Micah throughout the book has been saying, if you keep going in this direction, if you keep wandering, if you keep disobeying, if you keep breaking the covenantal agreement that we have made, things will not go well for you. Ruin and destruction will come your way. But anytime a prophet gives a message, there's always two sides to that message. There is the message of warning and judgment that is to come, but there's also the other side of deliverance and hope. Because he's saying, if you turn back to God, if you come back to Him, there will be deliverance, redemption, and restoration. So we're in this part of the book where Israel basically is asking these questions. Okay, so how is it that we turn back to God? Should we bring offerings? Is that what God wants? Does God want a bunch of our stuff and our animals and our livestock and our resources? Is that what God wants? And so Micah poses these questions in verse 6 and 7 as though they are coming from the mouths of Israel. He's personifying Israel. But then in verse 8, he switches, and now he's speaking as though he's speaking for God, from God, the voice of God. And this is what we read in verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so with these three things, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, myself, Nathan, and Mark, are going to charge Chris. And so for me, I've been given the task of what does it mean for Chris to act justly? What does it mean for all of us to act justly when it comes to living a life for the Lord? Now, one of the things that Micah is doing in his book is he's specifically talking to the leaders of Israel. We read in chapter 3, if you were to go back a couple chapters, chapter 3, verse 1, 
It says, Then I said, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? Kind of implying, yes, you should embrace justice. Kind of also implying, you have not embraced justice. The characterization of your leadership is actually a lack of justice, injustice. And you have this really strong description. If you read through more of chapter 3, you have this really strong, almost brutal description of the way that the Israelite leaders have been leading the people of Israel. And actually, the description of it is brutal. It's cannibalistic language. They have been feasting off their people. They've been flesh, tearing off their flesh, putting their bodies in pots to consume their people. It's this horrible language. Essentially, what he's saying is that you have been brutalizing your people. You are using your people for your own benefit. You are eating your people alive. You are using your position of power to take advantage of the people that God has entrusted to your care. And so there's this contrasting image in the book of Micah of bad leadership, abusive leadership, literally cannibalistic leadership, contrasted with the gentleness of a shepherd. And what does it mean to act justly in the context of leading God's people? It's to operate as a shepherd, to care for the people, to feed them, not feed off of them. And so when Micah says in 6 8, act justly, he is saying to those leaders, use your position of power and influence to serve those in your care. It reminds me, if we make a connection to the New Testament, of what Paul says in Philippians 2. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, do nothing out of vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourself. Look not only to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. As a pastor, you are charged with caring for your people. As a pastor, you are called to lay your life down for the sake of those you lead. As a pastor, you are called to shepherd your people and think about them and what's best for them before you ever think about yourself. And even though in the pastoral world, we don't like to think about like being in a position of power, like there's a resistance, I think, sometimes to pastors that we, we, don't, we don't serve so we can have power, but the reality is when you're in leadership, you have power, you have influence, you have position, and the call is to use that for the sake of others. So as a, as a family um, who carries the last name of Marvel, like one of the things we've been doing is watching the Marvel movies with our kids, like kind of got to do that. And so... We've just finished uh, the Spider-Man trilogy, the newest one, the Tom Holland one, the cute Spider-Man, as so my kids say. And, and, and Spider-Man, um, in Spider-Man, there's this quote that says, with great power comes great responsibility. I know that maybe seems kind of cheesy to like, use a Spider-Man quote, um, but it captures what you have. You have influence in this community, and you are called, Chris, to use that influence for the sake of other people. You have influence, and with that comes great responsibility to care for the people that God has placed here under your leadership. So we're glad to have you, and we trust that you will do that. I'm going to invite my dad, Mark, to come and take us into the next part of this passage. Well, you might have been asking before that introduction, who am I and why am I here? Along with being Brian's father, I got to know Chris because we are in similar roles. I'm the executive pastor at Elmbrook Church. And uh, maybe a short time after Chris came and got settled, I invited him to a men's group that meets on Thursday mornings at the Panera Bread in Greenfield, close to to the town of Brookfield. If you've ever been there, you'll notice in the middle of the room, there's this large oval table and there's about eight of us that sit. Most people in the restaurant know we're there and know that we're opening our Bibles. And Chris came and we quickly learned that Chris loves to read aloud. 
If you know anything about Chris, whenever he's in a room and he speaks, his voice fills the room. So on Thursday morning, the men of our men's group kind of chose Chris as the unofficial reader of our scriptures. And when he starts to read, everybody in the restaurant knows what we're reading. <laughs> but you know what? Chris does it with poise, and he does it with confidence. He's not ashamed to be seen as a follower of Jesus. So, Chris, you demonstrate a boldness and a confidence that drives you to not be ashamed. And you connect well with the people around you. So as you come today, as you come forward to be an ordained minister of the faith, Micah 6.8 is a charge to you to engage your faith every day and in all situations in very specific ways. Part two of the verse is a directive for you to embrace and then to encourage those who you minister to. See, the instruction from Micah is this, love mercy. So to better understand Micah's instruction, we need to explore what it means, this word mercy. Well, according to Webster Dictionary, mercy is a compassionate treatment of those in, a, in distress, a blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion. Well, according to the Bible, mercy is equal to kindness and also the withholding of punishment. See, grace and mercy are contrasted in God's word often as he expresses his love to us. God's grace is the giving to us that which we did not earn, our salvation, our eternal life. But mercy is the withholding from us that which we deserve, the punishment of our sins. The most significant act that God expressed in Scripture was a merciful act was for Jesus to take the punishment of our sins. God's great act was to show us how much he loved us by sending Jesus to the cross for us. So the biblical meaning for mercy comes from the Hebrew word hesed, which is defined in different ways. It describes kindness demonstrated toward others by giving support. It also means benevolence given to those, especially the marginalized or the needy, or those individuals experiencing misery. So hesed, or mercy, means showing kindness to others. It means extending a helping hand and, and helping somebody up, especially those individuals in need. So in summary, mercy is showing kindness to others. See, God shows mercy to those who are suffering and are, and are experiencing times of distress. So showing mercy means a, to demonstrate compassion and kindness that flows from a glad heart. The book of James tells us that our acts of compassion spring forth from our faith in God. So according to Micah's charge, Mercy is not only to show kindness, but to love kindness. See, Micah asked the religious leaders, what does the Lord expect from you? Chris, this question that Micah asked the leaders of his day is also relevant to you as you join in with other individuals who work in ministry today. The obligation of an ordained minister of the gospel is to have a heart of mercy and demonstrate kindness to those, to those you minister to. So the instruction of Micah 6, 8 is for leaders to engage justice, kindness, and humility. 
See, this forms a sort of a flow of how Jesus answered a scribe when questioned in Jerusalem. The scribe asked, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, this is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. See, this instruction, along with Micah, tells us to do the same, to love God and to love others. Some of you may know that Jema and I, my wife Jema and I, have been caring for seniors in our home for about 15 years. I tell you this because I understand the commitment needed to provide this act of compassion. You may know that Chris has opened his home to his parents, Mark and Sherry. Chris and Mary Beth did some remodeling to make the, a comfortable space for them because they can look down the road and see that his parents will need some help in the years to come. See, being a caregiver is not for everyone. But Chris, from my observation, from my seat, I see that you demonstrate toward your parents an outflow of, of mercy that is directly related to our teaching from Jesus, from James, and from Micah. This act of kindness is a result of Micah's charge to love mercy. So Chris, God prepared you and is transforming you for a life of ministry. My final encouragement to you is this, Chris. Continue to love God and love others. Be a communicator in the faith of the faith that God has bestowed upon you. And love mercy with all your hearts. Amen to that. I invite Nathan up to carry us forward. Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. <clears throat> what a privilege it is to be here. And um, I've already just enjoyed uh, mingling with a handful of you. And uh, what, a, what a great church body um, you have. Um, Chris and Mary Beth, uh, Kellen and Cammie, it's, it's a privilege to be here today with you. Um, I'll never forget when Chris and Mary Beth and their kids first came to Kingwood, the church I pastor in Salem, Oregon, and um, they, were, they were there, they sat through the service, and um, I went and said hello to them. At one point, my wife went and said hello to them, and afterwards, we're both driving home after the worship gathering, and Kelsey just said, Nathan, did you see that family that was here? Um, I'm like, yes, and she was like, they're nice and they're normal. And I'm like, yes, they are. <laughs> so just let the record be said today that you have a nice and normal executive pastor, all right? <laughs> um, we were, my wife and I said, we, we want them. We, we really want them at Kingwood. And so that week, we actually prayed a handful of times, God, put the Hogan family at our church. And so you can imagine how ecstatic we were when the next week we went back and there they are again. And the week after that and the week after that, and they never left until it was time when God called them here. And, you know, it was hard because actually in that time we became friends. Um, my wife and I entered um, this pastoral ministry kind of saying that we're not really here to make friends. And I know that sounds kind of funny. We're like, we're here to develop great relationships, but we're here to really lead. And friendship wasn't what we were after, 
But friendship is what we got. Uh, we got that with the Hogans and with a number of other people back in Salem. Um, so again, we're just such a privilege. And you know what? We really sense that this is where God wants them. And so we are grateful for the work that God is doing through Chris and Mary Beth. And I love how you both just serve together. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, Chris and I would meet for coffee. And there was one time where Chris just said, well, there's, there's three occupations my wife said I can never have. One is a politician. The second is an astronaut. And the third is a pastor. But then there came that, that day when Mary Beth texted Chris. And I think the text message was something as simple as this, it's time. And Chris knew that when Mary Beth said it's time, he knew exactly what she meant. And when Chris shared that with me, I too knew exactly what that meant. Because it's not about hoarding people, but it's about releasing people and multiplying people and making disciples wherever it is. And this is a wonderful place to make disciples, as is Oregon. But we do it together. And, and just, again, what a privilege. So the, the final part of Micah 6.8 is to walk humbly with your God. Five words, rather simple. Walk humbly with your God. The very first thing I, I hear there is I hear walk with walk with not walk ahead not lag behind but walk with and there is something so human about this where we want to get ahead of God God how come you're not keeping up with me God can we just move a bit faster here and there are other times where we're like, God, you're going way too fast. Slow down, please. Walk with. The, the speed at which God moves, according to Micah the prophet, is he walks. And God invites us to walk with him. Walk with. Walk with. How do we walk with him? We walk with him in humility. This might sound really surprising, I don't know. But I think for pastors, it actually, and I speak for myself, can be actually easy to become a little bit cocky or a little bit arrogant. I really think it is. I, I know that our culture is growing at large, kind of becoming a bit more disenamored with the church as a whole in America. And yet, subculturally in the church, we have people who look to us for guidance. They value our voice. They want to hear from us. They need leadership. And in that, we as pastors, we're human beings. We understand that. And we can get caught up in Viewing ourselves, watching the online service, seeing what I did well. How, how often did people compliment me? Micah says to Israel and to the leadership of Israel, walk humbly, walk in humility, walk humbly. In those last two words, walk humbly with your God. I like that because Micah doesn't just say, walk humbly with God. I mean, he could have said that. And we would know exactly what he meant by that. But Micah really made that personal. Walk humbly with your God. Not just God, but walk humbly with your God. There is something personal here. Chris, one of the greatest gifts that you can give Meadowbrook is a personal relationship with your God. An authentic relationship. We, we know what's right. The longer we're in ministry, the more we know how I need to answer, what is the right way to lead. And yet, 
Walking humbly with your God. My God means it's personal. People are smart. They, they know when we're faking it. And they also sense when there's authenticity. And authenticity comes when it's personal. My God. I want to walk humbly with my God. And so, Chris, I charge you this morning to walk humbly with your God, who happens to be Pastor Brian's God, Pastor Mark's God, my God. We do this collectively, but you also do it individually. And as you do it individually, Understanding your relationship with the God of the universe, which comes through faith in Jesus. When we understand that, people see that. They take note of that. They take note of the humility. Act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. I, I think... Chris, this becomes your prayer. This is already the cry of your heart, which is why you chose this passage. This becomes your prayer for your ministry. And to brothers and sisters in this room, this becomes a beautiful prayer for your executive pastor and for all of your pastors here. Uh, they might be people who act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Chris and Mary Beth, so thankful for you. Love you so much. And so grateful that you are here at Meadowbrook. At Meadowbrook, I trust that you know, and I'm hearing already that you know, that you are blessed to have Chris as your executive pastor. And so with that, I just want to pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your working, your doing, how you have orchestrated all of this. God, it's beautiful. You called Chris and Mary Beth here to Wisconsin, to Meadowbrook Church. God, I, I'm asking that you would be working continually in Chris's heart. God, may, be, may he be a pastor that strives to act justly, to love mercy, and then to walk humbly with you, his God, and as he lives with authenticity of his faith. I pray and trust that others will take note and they will follow. And that this might be done for the honor and glory of you, God, who we love. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.